And so he doesn't do it. Well, we're going to go ahead and we're going to go ahead and begin. We'll just commit our time to the Lord. Lord, we just want to tell you this afternoon that we're just so grateful to be here gathered in your name. We thank, we thank you, Lord, that you've been here with us, in our midst, leading us, speaking to us, opening our hearts, ministering to our hearts. We just thank you, Lord. Lord, we look to you even for this time this afternoon. Lord, we could be satisfied with the riches that you poured out on us. But Lord, we want to open our hearts and open the door for everything. Lord, that need purpose for our time here together, for everything that is upon your heart. Lord, you know the questions we have. You know some of the thoughts or the things that still may be hindering us. Lord, we believe you brought us here to rapture us in your heart and to release us to function in your house. And Lord, we ask as we would have this time of fellowship together that indeed we would be released to function in your house, to be a, a joint of supply for the building up of the body. Oh Lord, that we might grow up into the fullness of the stature which belongs to Christ, that fullness of who you are. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for who you've made us to be, who you've destined us to be. We thank you for your life within Christ in us, that hope of glory. We thank you, Lord, for this glorious church that has no spot, nor wrinkle, nor any such thing. And we just look to you now and in the days ahead that you would bring us in to that glorious end. Bring us in, even in our experience, to that reality of the work that you completed on the cross. Lord, that we might be all, Lord, that you desire us to be as the bride of Christ, as the people of God. We ask for your help now. We do lean upon you, the guide in this time. We pray that you would guide us and lead us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So for our time here this afternoon, um, what, we, what we sense from the Lord he would have us to do. Jeffrey's going to do a little recap, um, just touch on a few things. It's connected with the questions, but also just giving a little bit of clarity to some of the things that he shared on last night. Um, so he will he will do that some. And again, it's related to some of the questions that were asked. There were some questions put in the basket um, yesterday and also today. So we're going to try to work through some of those questions in this time here this afternoon. Two of the questions um, we had, we'd like to have two people specifically come up related to those and just share a little something just to give us some illustration um, and, and put a little bit of, uh, the, I guess, meat on the bones related to those. And then we'll probably have some, some comments and thoughts around that as well. So, Jeffrey, did you want to go ahead and sure, get up? And I'm not, I'm not uh, summarizing what I said. I just feel like I'm always running out of time, right? Um, but because of that, some things that are barely said that deserve re-emphasizing don't get said loud enough. So I just wanted to say it a little bit louder. Um, first thing is, when, when we were talking about the, the anointing that's upon the, the church that's in the unity, that commanded blessing that's, that's when the brethren dwell together in unity. As we were talking about that, and even the, the right that every member of the church has to come under that anointing, um, our emphasis is going by way of faith in the Lord Jesus who's ascended. I hope we caught that part. So uh, like I was saying in the past, my seeking was trying to find it through some means, through some experience somewhere. And I, and I think from the scripture I could say, that does happen. And you can see from many people's stories, that does happen like the Ephesian disciples, whether they were just getting saved or, or whatever was, getting hap was happening. Sometimes that does happen. And if you build a teaching out of it, I think it, it kind of cuts many Christians off. If you build a teaching out of any of your experiences, you'll realize it's limited. So that limited experience with some Christians is not the experience of all Christians and I'd venture to say, I don't think it's the experience of all Christians in the Bible. 
I think um, maybe the majority of the New Testament Christians came into the anointing without the experience of a physical laying on of hands and without the experience of, of a, a Pentecost-like thing that happened to, for example, Cornelius and his household. I was trying to say that those are really unique things and special times, and the Lord does do that. But what we're, what we're learning is there's a normal way to regularly come into that anointing. And even if you've had an experience in the past, like those did at Pentecost, they still come back to the Lord for specific reasons, like boldness to preach the gospel right now as threats are happening, or just to walk in a regular way as a, a person that's filled with the Holy Spirit as a habit. Now, this doesn't mean like so specific, like I sense the anointing to share something in this meeting. That's pretty specific or I sense the anointing to share the good news with this person I just saw, but more like, like those seven that were picked out in the book of Acts. Choose seven men that are filled with the Holy Spirit, like, or like in Ephesians when he's like, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. That type of being filled with the Spirit has mainly to do with just being empty vessels of the world and yourself and allowing the Lord to regularly have his place, just to make room for the Lord. Now, I would say if you live that way, that whenever it comes time to function in your gifting, it's quick. It's not like you suddenly need to drum up getting right with the Lord first and also like getting help with anointing and filling and everything like that. You instead just are walking with the Lord and it comes time for something. And then by faith, you just look to the Lord and say, amen. And then you obey him because he's Lord and he's on the throne as the body part. You just do what the head says. And that way of faith works. And I found it to work. And sometimes I feel it, and sometimes I don't feel it, but it works. And sometimes I feel it with the gospel preaching, and people are saved. And sometimes I don't feel it with gospel preaching, and people are saved. Because I faith it. And so when, whether I feel it or not is not the issue anymore. The sensing of the anointing has to do with a sensing of the head, which is Christ. And he's the one in charge of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. He's the one that... The oneness is based on. When brethren dwell together in unity, it's because we gather in his name. That's the only thing holding us all together in this place too. Lots of different backgrounds and personalities and styles and giftings and whatever and ages, but the head is the same and he holds us together and we find our unity right there at Christ. So holding fast the head, we grow together and we also are functioning together, building each other up in love. So that was the, the emphasis. So even though we had a time after, after the sharing, specifically for any who felt like they actually did want to be prayed for, but the emphasis was for the rest of us believers that we just purpose to go this way of faith. Whether you feel like I need someone to pray for me right now, or you just feel like I need to just behold the Lord and praise him and make sure I'm an empty vessel available for the Lord. So I say we could have done last night without even an opportunity for people to be prayed for. And the same point is made because the point was to regularly walk by faith. The point is not that you need weekly a, a, an altar call or anything like that. It's just occasionally when we're at such a gathering like this, I was just sensing that there's some in the room that that the Lord did want us to pray for. So that's that's what that was. So I hope that clarifies some. This isn't some new habit of something. Our way is this way of faith. Um, where, okay, so that's something. And then another thing I wanted to bring up is, um, you know, I like this song. Uh, I like I like the 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 heart of it, um, the make room song we sing afterwards. And one thing it says in there, which I think is right, like to break down these walls that's going on. We've got tradition, then we've got our own religion. And I just wanted to clarify something with that. Not about the song, but I want to clarify about just this concept. You find yourself with like some habits. I would say a lot of them are holy habits or they are past grace that the Lord has worked that is part of your foundation. It's part of who you are, where you've come from. And in the churches, this is a glorious thing that as we um, catch on the, uh, the torch of the testimony, as we're passing on, the Lord from one to another and, and the ages are handing down the grace that they've received. We, we're not trying to break out of something because what we're doing is we're all holding fast the head 
And so if you've got a habit, like I thought it was great, they mentioned where they break bread in Indianapolis, they wait and hold on to the, the bread and the cup and they, they do it together. And even said like, this is our tradition and so on. You know, it's when, when we're trying to follow, follow the Lord and be free, we don't want our traditions to become walls that block the Lord. But that does not mean we're throwing every habit away that we've got and we have to start fresh from nothing. It doesn't mean that you've got to pretend like you've never learned anything. It just means you've got to hold on to the Lord and he leads you right from where you're at. So if he has an issue with some tradition as we follow him, he can adjust it. But we don't need to throw everything away. Actually, a lot of it's precious. And you may not even know why it's precious. And that's why it's helpful to ask, why do we do this thing? It's helpful to fellowship with the saints. It's helpful that we're in churches with people that are older than us. It's like essential, actually. Um, so I just wanted, I wanted to bring that up and, and uh, mention how, like, like when the Lord Jesus is ministering to the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, he is working with them exactly where they're at. He's walking in their midst. He knows where they're at, and he says, I know what's going on. And then he, he ministers to them, but he ministers to them from where they're at. Whoever's going to overcome is going to overcome their current situation. What he does not say is, this church is broken. Like, let's, let's just start new. Everybody go next door and let's do something new. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't say that. I mean, there, some of them were in danger of that. He's like, I'm about to remove your lampstand. It's getting really bad. And if that happens and the Lord is like, this thing is just, you guys are doing witchcraft or whatever. You guys are just totally gone. But for the most part, I think none of us will probably experience that. Mostly it's the Lord is ministering to your church where you're at. And I think that will come up with later questions like sometimes you feel like the whole church is blocking everything uh, with you. So we'll get to that. And I, I really don't think that's the case. Okay, one last thing is we have different personalities and we have different cultures. And this has to do with their unity. We also have different giftings. And even though in the Corinthian church, He's like, I'm, I'm thankful that you guys have like every gifting there. He, the way he says it at the beginning of the Corinthian letter is, it's as if like, actually a lot of churches don't have that going on. You know, you, it, maybe the Corinthians had such a large variety of giftings, but in any given church, we're not trying to expect that everything on this, this you know, list that we could come up with has got to be with somebody. And if it's not there, we're doing something wrong. It's just not true. You may be in a church that, that there's, there's just nobody with that gifting. And that's okay. We all have the grace of God to do what we actually need to do. So we don't want to put that on everybody or us try to think that we need to drum that up. We're trying to discover by the grace of God where his anointing actually is for our spot in the body of Christ. Um, so with that, some people are kind of more stoic. Some of it might actually be like their personality, might be their background, but some of it may even have to do with their, guilt, their gifting. And this never has to do with their love for the Lord. This never has to do with like their maturity in the Lord. And it never has to do with them walking in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You know, somebody may get into the anointing and a little tear drops down their cheek. And someone else may step into the anointing for the first time. And their expression is so loud. Like you have to ask them to be a little quieter. Um, and, and part of it is just those other things. But I'm just saying like this anointing that's upon the church has to do with unity. And so by default, it does not have to do with how it's expressed. It does not have to do with which gifting it goes for. This anointing is for the gift of helps and the gift of mercy and the gift of prophecy and the gift of tongues and all of these varieties of giftings is for all the functions in the body of Christ. So if you feels like, well, this person's a real worshiper, you know, you just have no idea. Only the Lord knows the spirit of worship and those who worship in spirit and in truth. Like I used to have an attitude against uh, those who prayed with uh, these and thous. And when I was first saved, I was a teenager and, and, you know, I was like, that's fake. That's just dead and religious. And then I, and then I got, I, you know, I'm, re I'm reading the Darby translation, right? And I found myself re like praying in thous and these on my own. <laughs> like it's kind of embarrassing. But when I just talked to the Lord by myself, he and I talk in like a really old English language. <laughs> because that's how I hear the Lord all the time. I hear the Lord through this translation, right? Because I in, in the scriptures. So it's like, it's like in my mind, when I go to talk to the Lord, like we have this other English going on. It's a little bit, it's also broken because Darby's got bad English. So me and the Lord, it's kind of like English as a second language, but it's anyway. And, uh, and I translate when I pray in public. So I don't use, usually use thousand these, but 
it switched my mind though to see like those believers, they were just reading the King James and that's just how the Lord speaks to them. That's how they speak back to the Lord. They might've had the most genuine prayers in the room. And so the one who, the one who kneels and the one who sits and the one who just is worshiping in their spirit and has no expression outwardly that you can tell. I'm just saying the obvious that I think we all know. But I think sometimes as we get into these things, we look around and we're like, that person's worshiping and that person, who knows? And, and you get this attitude. It's, it's like kind of a youthful attitude or a, a bad attitude. But because of the unity of the brethren, God has glorified all of this stuff. And he is, he's calling all of us to worship in spirit and truth. So um, it's not to judge someone who, who wants to stand up when everyone else is sitting. It's not to judge someone who wants to sit when everyone else is standing. It's just to be worshipers together. When I see the variety, I actually see the glory of the Lord with it. Um, so I just wanted to mention all that. I, I appreciate all of the saints that I've been around for so many years. And I appreciate the believers that are out there that, 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 are, that I've met and that I haven't met. I just think that the Lord wants all of us. And so everything that we've been talking about this weekend is not something that takes away from what we've received. What we're hoping for is that we hang on to everything we've ever received of Christ. And that if we can come into more of Christ, like that's what we're seeking after. So I hope that clarifies a little bit of that. So I had some questions to do with to do with things and and um I just wanted to mention those things. So that's it. Yeah, I don't I don't know if this is necessary, but we've been going to the nursing home and having a time of worship and fellowship with some older uh, people there. Mostly it seems like believers or probably some unbelievers. But with that, most of them can't see well. They can't hear well. When we're having a time of worship and we're fellowshipping, they're very stoic. You're like, right, Kristen? Like sometimes you're like, are they really with us? But I think it just, just, just shared to illustrate that point. Like, but when they open up, when you talk with them one-on-one, -on -one, they're so full of Christ. And they're like, that was such a wonderful time, even though on their face, that facial expression may be very like, because a lot of them just actually physically have, it's a rehabilitation center too, like physically have it. I'm just using that to kind of, again, further illustrate that point that however God leads us in that expression, um, it's, it's about that and, you know, what's really happening w within the hall. So uh, one of the questions that came up, and also one other thing I just want to mention what Jeffrey said when he talked about that anointing, it's connected often with actually stepping into the service or the gifting or the function. So he mentioned that, but I just want to say it again. Like, it's like, oh, oh Lord, just I want to be full of your spirit, right? And there may be those times where you're just with the Lord and you're just filled with the spirit. It's wonderful. But often it is in that place of, I'm, and I'm now, by the grace of God, I'm stepping into what the Lord's asked me to do. You, he spoke to you. He's called you to something. You may not feel it, but by faith, you do look up, see him on the throne. You receive that anointing you, because that anointing is in that place when you're under the head. I think someone said that, expressed that last night. Where is it? It's under his headship. So if you're there in the will of God, you know there's an anointing for that time. You know it. If you're in the will of God, and you're doing what he's asked you to do, you know there's an anointing for that time. So you can step into that thing. And so it's like, we want to experience that. It's going to be, let's be in the will of God. Let's be where the Lord is as it relates to us. And that's where we find that, that anointing to do his will. I think even like Stephen stepping up here this morning, sometimes it's like you get up, it's like, I don't feel anything right now. But when you stand up, you're stepping into that place God's called you. He, he told you to speak and you step up in obedience of faith and you find there's an empowering. And this is often in evangelism as well. It's like sometimes we go out and like we're shaking a little bit. We're setting things out. We're about to do a big outreach. But as soon as we step into it, it's like, whoa, like you just feel empowered. I remember even Kristen, like we've done a few outreaches at the park, super nervous. But then I see her out there and she's like as bubbly as can be, inviting people in, talking to them. And there is like that transformation that happens because it's the anointing, that anointing power of the Holy Spirit that enables you, fills you with the boldness and enables you to just do what God's called you to do. He's enabling because it's Christ in us and he's enabling us by his spirit to function in that capacity. So I know he said it. I just wanted to say it one more time and then, um, just to underscore that. So...
one question um, that we had uh, was, what exactly is the gift of mercy? What exactly is the gift of mercy? So I think Catherine's going to come up for a moment here. She's going to get obedience of faith to step into the... No, 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 before you come up, let me say this. I was just going to, I mean, from the Bible, I was just going to grab an illustration. I, I think if I was going to borrow someone in the scriptures who seems like they're so functioning in this to a fault, it would be Barnabas. Because of um, when Paul got saved, actually, he's the one who grabs him and brings him in when he gets to Jerusalem. And everybody's scared of him, but he actually finds him. I mean, he grabs him. Later, he finds him as true in his hometown. But And Bar Barnabas, you know, he was named like, this guy's the big teddy bear. Like, he's the he's the comforter, the, um, the son of encouragement. But the, the way that he brought him in, I don't think it was necessarily a discerning of spirits and figuring out, is this guy evil or not? Is he tricking us? I don't think it was that I, that was going on. I think he's just the one more likely to actually welcome the evil looking guy. Um, you know, so, so and then also the same thing happened when when Mark had to get discipline for like leaving them when persecution came on their on their journey. And Paul was like, he can't come with us more. It was almost like Barnabas, so full of mercy, just could not see Mark just getting totally outcast, and it became a major conflict. So, I don't know. I just think there's there's something of a, like a question with me. Like this, I think at least we could borrow Barnabas for a second and just say like this this mercy thing. All of us have mercy, but you know that you need grace for mercy, right? But there's some that the Lord just like when they get grace for mercy, maybe the first or second time. The grace is so abundant that they're like built with it. And what is normally for us, like, all right, Lord, give me grace again for mercy. For them, it's like immediate and they're, they're flowing with it. And they, they kind of are built that way. Sometimes it might be to a fault. So um, I think people that get broken in a general way. Um, so this, this is, a, you know, all of, the, all of the moms have been broken by babies for sure. Um, all the parents, we, we lose our hair and get, um, get crazy. But, you know, one thing that happened is you learn mercy. It is a salvation that happens when you can't do everything the way you thought you could do. When I was very on time to church meetings in Richmond until I had babies. I mean, my wife had babies. And then we're like, we're going to be on time. And then the, the diaper blows out. And I was like, I'm late. And I used to be the guy that would look at people coming in late, right? Where I'd be like, why can't you just be on time? And then it was like, I'm coming in and everybody's, you know, scowling at me. Um... And I would say, if you're the guy with the scowl, just look forward, okay? Don't look back. And if you have to look back all the time, go sit in the back because it's really distracting. But anyway, if you're not that person, so we also had a couple of ladies in the church that I know. I mean, I really think the Lord showed me, like, they have the gift of mercy. And these ladies, and sometimes one of these ladies would be late too, right? But these ladies would look at you and smile and get you to come sit by them, and you just felt like you felt the Lord's mercy. Like, he wants you to come in that room. You know what I mean? Even, even in a culture where it was like, you should just overcome and be on time. It was like, the mercy was overflowing from, from some of those. Um, so, because Catherine married me without the gift of mercy, <laughs> she, uh, you know, she followed my style, and, and poor girl, um, I heard pro I, th I think, personally, I think she probably has this gifting. But I think it was dormant because of her husband. And the Lord had to deal with me a lot and work with me and show me how, how bad of a husband I was and other things like that. How I was a law type of husband instead of a grace husband. Um, but but uh, anyway, she has a story of, of some experiences of coming into uh, to this and what I think is this also, but just like a place in the church. So we do want you to share some of that if that's okay. Oh, we got a chair and a white. Is our mic over there? Yeah. The more we're close to you. No. Patient kids are still. They might be. Skill spear. Hey, grab her. She said it. Um. 
Yeah. So this didn't even come up as a conversation ever until like a week ago or something. And then about the whole mercy thing. And, um, actually, if you knew me 20 years ago, you would have never said that I was somebody that had mercy. And actually, some of my deepest sin regrets are the way I treated members of the body of Christ and how I condemned them when they came to you with their sin. And instead of extending mercy, I gave them the law. And honestly, to this day, there's people I've apologized to like five times and it will never feel like enough because my deepest regrets, my deepest sin regrets are how I didn't show mercy when someone came to me with a sin. Um, but that, anyways, um, it's because I was not deep merciful 20 years ago. I was very law. Um, I, I don't even know where to start really. I, I, I guess one story I could share, um, is that, uh, some years back in Richmond that they asked, would I, would I lead the two-year-old or the myth and the kids ministry at the conference? And I just, I despised the thought. I was like, eighties, you know, I'm like better than working with babies. I'm sorry. That was just my, I just, yeah, I'm sorry. But. I, I was like, oh, I'll get fat to you. I didn't really want to do that. I would have rather done something a little more glorious um, or a little bit more, with more fellowship involved or more something. Um, and so I, I really didn't give her an answer. I was like, I'll, yeah, I'll get back to you. And then I went to another conference where I ended up in the nursery accidentally because nobody was really caring for our kids. And I just couldn't stand to see that they were, nobody was really welcoming kids when they arrived. And so just by default, I ended up in this room and I just started playing with kids because I really do love children. And it was kind of natural. And someone even said, like, how come all the kids come to you? And I don't know. In that moment, the fact that somebody said something and that I had this thing upon me while I worked at the nursery, I, I think the Lord just started speaking to me, like, maybe this is something. Um, and so... I don't know. I went back and I, I filled in yes, I would help at the conference. And ever since I've been helping at the conference in the near street, but I will say with it, what happened and what happens to this day, every time I work with kids, every time I say, yes, I'll watch the kids. And even increasingly it's like some, I was sharing with some like group yesterday, but there really is some flow that happened. And even I've been at a Bible study and someone's like, Oh, we need someone to watch kids or something. And, you know, first you're like, do I want to leave Bible study? But then I'll say yes to the Lord. And there's just like some joy that comes. And um, even fear sometimes, like, at, you know, I'll find a kid and talk to them. And it's not because I feel like they're being neglected or they need a parent or they need something. It's just like, I see a kid and I just want to talk with them. And I, because I feel like I meet the Lord as I'm talking with the kid. And that the Lord, even last night, we were in this for a writer everyone was having different experiences and you know i didn't have any opportunity to pray in the room or to respond and i had a lot of emotions going on but then the lord brought me a child and then he brought me another child and i was able to pray and kind of express what the lord was doing in my heart even towards that child and it was really neat and the lord was just like that's your experience of play like, responding anyway that's i don't know that this all points to mercy um but it is something that the Lord's done in me. I know another time I had an experience preparing for Sunday school, and it was a really powerful experience just being in the Word. And I was preparing to share on the book of Ruth. And I just read through that passage about Boaz and how he goes up to Ruth and he says, I've seen, I know, I saw you, I know this about you. And the Lord just exposed this longing in my heart to be seen and for someone to know about me. And he even showed me that some of my sin and sins that I've struggled with come out of that longing to be seen. And then through seeing that and through exposing that in myself, he started to put this ability in me to see other people. Not like see in some weird way, like I don't have any word of knowledge, but to see like, I see that nobody sees you and I see you now. And I see the kids that are alone and it's not, it's not me. And I am very aware that it's not me, which is why I feel like I can talk about it freely because I didn't have that. I, I know that's from the Lord. And I know he let me see this weakness in myself and this longing in myself 
so that I could see it in other people and just see that the Lord sees our children. And I actually, I think it's a, a deep problem going on, especially with phones and everything, is that as moms, we aren't seeing our children when they really need us to see them because we're seeing other things. That's a, that's a whole other thing. But I don't know. I just feel like that is the word, and he's allowed me to see that. And he's even someone in the church that I had the greatest, greatest trouble with. And one day the Lord let me see her worshiping. And I was like, from that day on, all of my trouble against her was gone because I saw her worshiping, like in a, a real moment of worship. And I was like, wow, Lord, you know her too. And you know her background and you all the, all the struggles she's gone through. And um, I don't know what that is, but I, I feel like the Lord has grown that to me through the word and through experiences just by responding to him in little things. So I don't know if that's what mercy is. I don't know if that's... Um, it's okay to not know what's going on, with you, but to sense the anointing. And uh, you say, for example, you're describing, I sense the anointing when I'm doing this stuff with kids. Now, I on the side, I'm just saying, I think possibly this type of stuff that she's touching yeah. is in this area of mercy. And I think the Lord's using it in a very functioning way for something like, like with children, right? Or even... Uh, with some others, I think with that gifting that I've seen is they they notice more. Um, they notice more like maybe some of the um, the down and out or the the neglected. Um, now, but this is something there's grace for all of us to do this. So as we follow the Lord, all of us are doing some of this. It's just sometimes somebody has a larger measure or encourages us in that way a little bit larger. Um, and I think it's a great example of how. You know, because of our, our background or the way we created our own background and our stubbornness to pursue the Lord, your, your gifting can very much not be matching your personality or your culture or your background. And then suddenly when it happens, it's like a surprise. You know, like the unexpected is, is in full of mercy. You know, I think that's glorious to the Lord. Or somebody that feels like I'm a teacher because I'm a school teacher. And I'm very intelligent. I've got a lot of thoughts in my mind. And I, and I read books. And I like to read books. And I read commentaries. And then the Lord just as they never sense the anointing, though, when it comes to Bible teaching. They never seem to have those light bulb discoveries as much. But, but when it comes to, like, helps, there's, like, such an anointing. They feel like this is where I find Christ more than anything. And so we can't think in the natural way necessarily. Sometimes it overlaps, but just not always. Anyway, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, and I just want to, um, you know, I really witnessed to, to that with Catherine, you know, like you kind of observe that. And one thing even before Catherine draw it out is like, yeah, you see the person. Because I, I have someone else in mind who I think also has this gift of mercy. And it is something the Lord works in us. The more we experience the mercy of God, the more we're merciful. We see how merciful the Lord is with us. We can't help but be more merciful with the people of God and with souls. So it is like by God's grace, but it seems like those with those gifts, and I think I mentioned the other day, like someone who has the gift of mercy, they actually teach us mercy. Because this person I have in mind is a brother in the Lord. And when I see the way he deals with certain people, certain people where even in the Lord, we kind of come to the end of our mercy. No, the Lord has no, no end. But in ourselves, even when we're experiencing God's mercy for someone, and you see like them go so much further in that that they see that person. It's like they, they don't stop no matter what happens, like how long it goes on, how difficult that person may be. It's like they still see them with the eyes of Christ and they're able to walk in that mercy. And it teaches you something. You just realize one, how unmerciful you are and how merciful Christ is. We see he is so full of mercy. His mercy has no end. And so um, anyway, thank the Lord for we got given it up. And I comment, um, is this normal? Is this part of the... Yes. Yeah, we dialogue. Okay. And so this one on the DMs, why did you on the magic and not me do that to hear me? So I was on the beach, I went to a day for food. And I, it was not adding school to that. And that means that was the most popular food everybody ate for. I had I looked at some sandwiches that were left over from yesterday, only the turkey is left. Okay? The roast beef is gone, the ants and everything is gone. I think 
that in God's storehouses plenty of mercy still abound. Because we're desiring gifts, when we are desiring best gifts, we're leaving off mercy. And I really appreciate what Catherine's character Because I think, let's just desire that for one another. Especially the body of Christ when you are interacting with one another. There's plenty of truth, but probably not as much mud, right? And mercy. And as uh, James himself said, you know, when the Lord introduced himself to, to Moses, he declared, he proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord, the Lord, merciful and great. So just to add on to what James says, you are more like the Lord when you are merciful. Okay. So it's not just okay, to desire mercy, but desire earnestly to be with and have bad Amen. 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 So this next question, actually, I'm going to just read one, but there were at least three who had the same, same sort of question around being a woman. That's how it starts. Being a woman. So the question was, what hinders you? What hinders you? What hinders you? So what hinders them is being a woman. <laughs> but like several said that. Yeah? Yeah. But, um, that's funny. but let me finish it because it wasn't just being a woman. There's more to it. So, but there is a period at the end of that. So it's being a woman for your woman. Uh, the function of a woman in a church or in the church meeting is clear, but there seems to be exceptions. For example, prophecy, right? There was a few others related. I don't know if, if, if I need to read all of them. Um, but I think it was basically around like, can a woman minister in God's house? Okay. So, so, um, I don't know if, if you guys had any thoughts. Go ahead. Well, what, well, I just wanted to I actually wanted to ask Morgan to come up when, when I read this question, it was interesting because like a few days ago, um, Morgan came into our living room and just started like pouring out her heart. And it was very much like related to this question. And I thought, um, she just kind of shared, she was kind of sharing her heart with us of how some things the Lord, something that's stirring in her heart. And she was kind of asking me this way of like, what's your, what's your all thought of this? But she, she, um, basically just shared a little bit of her story. And I thought there were like a lot of good points to illustrate out of that. So, you know, I asked Morgan if she'd be willing to help to share a little, kind of share that, that story with us. Yeah, so here on this Florida, well, not right now, but I've been in Florida for six years, and I uh, thought I originally saw him in Indiana. And for, I got saved when I was 18 years old, and it was a work of God, and you're with God. That's all of our salvations are about for, like, in my head, it was just, like, amazing. And, uh, delivered from five of things and uh really was going I was I mean I was running as fast as I could to hell and the Lord turned me around. So uh when that happened, um started going to church and um shortly after going to church, after maybe a couple of months or something like that, my pastor had come to me and he said, uh, will you share your your testimony? And, uh, with the youth, um, on uh, like a Friday night or something. And I said, okay. I said, what's a testimony? Uh, so I did not come from church. I did not grow up in church. And so I don't have, didn't have any doctrine or anything. I just knew that the Lord loved me <laughs> and I knew that, uh, that I was his. And that's, that was all that I knew. And, uh, and I said, Yes, uh, what do I do? And he said, uh, you know, go home, pray about it. He said, I'm going to share your, you know, kind of see if you can get some, some meat, some scriptures, um, and uh, just share your story. And that's it. I'm so okay. So uh, I did just that for, I, I had a week to prepare. Is, uh, every day I was just, you know, reading my Bible. And uh, again, I didn't know. I, I get I didn't have scripture basic I I didn't have a lot of knowledge of God. I had very 
very little. And, uh, but everybody has a story, you know? Uh, you know, it's, it's, we went on by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And so I said, well, I got the one part, blood of the lamb, so let's do this word of testimony thing. So I shared my story that Friday night. And as I shared, um, as I know now, uh, the Holy Spirit came upon me and it was it, telling a story turned into preaching and, um, and, and, and like a fire, like it was like a out of body experience. I mean, at that time in my head, you know, like, wow, it just power and just excitement and, th- and enthusiasm. And, and, um, I, I got done and, uh, the pastors came up and he gave an altar call and I watched like an angry percent of the people come up and, huh, you know, like pray, give their lives to the Lord, you know, uh, be changed, uh, convicted, whatever was happening. Um, then I was like, wow, okay. And, uh, never did expect that. Um, here's the thing, um, this is. I've had some backlash with uh, about women being able to minister in the church, um, but um, I didn't know. I didn't know about any of those scriptures from the get go. I just knew to say yes. Like I was asked, and I said yes, and I felt I was being obedient to the Lord, obedient to what the man of God of the house was asking. Hey, will you do this? And I said yes. And so I've simply, my whole Christian walk has simply just said about a yes, just an obedience. Um, I have zero agenda. I, I, I don't care to be up here right now, honestly. Um, I, it, well, it, with that being said, um, I, I, there is this unction, there is this thing inside of me that like pulls, pulls me. And it's like, if I don't, uh, it, there's something wrong. It's like you feel you feel sick if you don't. Um, and so, uh, I started ministering at the youth uh, as was every time I was asked. I'd say yes. Um, and then um, I started being invited to other churches, and uh, the same thing was happening. Get up, minister, power of God, and people were getting saved and. Uh, and it, and it was, I, I don't know, it, it was beautiful. And um, I never wanted to be, I still don't want to be anybody. Uh, I just want to be his. I, I want to, I want to, I want to say yes to him. I I want to say yes to him because that, that that's like, honestly, that's all I have is a yes. That's, that's all I had. Like when I, when I said yes to Christ, I gave up my life. I gave up my decisions. I said yes to Christ, and so he became Lord. And so him being Lord, it's like, who am I to say no? Who am I to not obey? And so with that obedience, it has come some, it, it, it has come some ridicule. Um, you know, I got saved the lifestyle I was living before I got saved. I was actually, uh, part of my testimony is I was actually in a lifestyle where I was with women. I was in a homosexual lifestyle. And so I was doing my own thing. And here I am, now that I say yes to the Lord, like, and he said, he's my number one, like what other choices do I have? And so that was a lifestyle of ridicule. You, you want to be ridiculed and you want to be mocked and you want to be, um, you know, just outcast or, or whatnot. You live that lifestyle. So that's the one I live. So when I became a Christian, I thought that was my out. I was like, man, this is going to be good. Like I had this idea in my head, like life is going to be rainbows now. The good kind of rainbow. It's just like, but you better this one. And, and, and it's, it's, it's going to be great. And uh, so I, I kind of, and, and, and so I, I can remember actually going to my uh, parents, you know, and saying like, I've, I've given, I've, I've gotten saved and they didn't believe me. <laughs> Uh, that's how bad I was in even. <laughs> and so then my, as my pastor, so I didn't know, didn't know it wasn't okay to minister in the church. All I knew was that I was just being obedient to the Lord. So then as, um, as it comes out, then I start sharing, you know, with, with my family, like, Hey, like, uh, 
my pastor said, after a few years, my pastor said he's wanted to ordain me. And not uh, he did. He, he ordained me as a minister of the gospel, as an evangelist, actually. And um, I remember going to my parents and saying, hey, this is what's getting ready to happen. And my parents looked at me and as if I was the most evil person in the room and said, absolutely not. That's not of God. And I was heartbroken because I was like, wait a second. You've been wanting me to like follow Jesus. And now I'm following him and it's wrong too. This is really confusing. And so here it is. I get ordained. So yeah, I didn't realize that I was going to be having like, I didn't know that it was, I didn't know I was going to be having such um, like a angst from the Christian body. I had aches from the Christian body before I was saved. Walk into a church when you got gay pie stuff on and see, ask yourself how you treat those people. That's because I was one of them. And so coming on the other side, I, I thought there was going to be this love and there was going to be this new way. And I was so walking the way. And, and, and honestly, on this side of things, it's actually much harder than <laughs> sometimes. It's much harder sometimes to walk in Christ and to just say, Lord, I'm, I'm following you. And, and I know that the arrows are coming and people are pointing their fingers and saying, you're not of the Lord and, and you shouldn't be doing this. And, and I'm like, I didn't ask to do this. I didn't, I, the question, you know, I didn't ask to be a woman. I didn't ask to have uh, an anointing to preach the gospel. I didn't ask for either of those things. In fact, I would love to, like, if we went on a trade we can but I don't have that opportunity. Like we can't. And the Lord doesn't desire that. The Lord desires me to stand as a woman in the authority of Christ under him and then and walk in the giftings that he has placed within me and the giftings that he's placed in you. He's he, that's what he wants. He wants us to all function as a body. And so I, you know, I I was in Indiana, you know, and I, and I was doing that. I minister, you know, about five, six years. And, and then, um, you know, the church ended up falling apart that I was at. And um, and, and then since then, like, I had, like, gone it to, to a couple different churches. And then I ended up just, like, coming to Florida. And when I came to Florida, I said, this is literally what I told myself. Not that, I mean, there were four reasons because I love Florida. But I was like... I'm going to Florida where A, nobody knows me. I'm never sharing my testimony. That's one thing I said. Because my testimony has caused screen hearing share with testimony. My testimony has caused so much um uh, angst. Which I you, you think that in a body of Christ that I would be like a thing where you're like, praise the Lord. Well, some people are like praise the Lord and other people are like, let me hide my children. And that's hurtful. But <laughs> it's really hurtful. So I came to Florida and I think I bowed. I said, I, I'm not sharing my testimony. I'm just in another church and I'm going to the beach. And that's what I'm doing. I am going to live this out of my life and I'm going to love it. I'm away from everyone that knows anything about me. I didn't come there with family. I did not come here with friends. I don't have any. Until these people came into my life, I, I didn't have anybody except for who I worked with. The people I work with don't even know my testimony. Like, legit. And so I thought that, like, all right, it's, it was almost kind of like an escapism, like, let's, let's start over. If we can start over, this is it. And that's what I was doing. And then and I get to know these lovely people. And uh, they're like, hey, you want to come out to, like, the, the park, Gilcrest Park? And we're doing, like, an outreach thing. And I'm like, okay, I'll come out and check it out because... I need to make some friends. I'd like to make some friends. I'd actually been designing some Christian friends. So I was like, okay, I'll go. And they're going and, and, and we're there and they set up music and you got Eric on his guitar, strumming away. And next thing you know, there's a microphone and I'm just like, no God, no, no God. And I only said no, like one stone. Don't get me wrong, but like, it was like a strong no. And I felt that unction to get on the mic and beat. And I didn't know what I was going to say. And I didn't have anything planned, obviously. 
But when you have the anointing to minister the gospel and God, he put that gifting inside of you, you can't not. So it was like one of those places where I just couldn't not. If I went home, like I, it was just going to be a really long ride home if I went home without get, saying a word. And, and I ministered and as I, and, and as I ministered, I mean, I, I think it was maybe a couple of minutes, whatever. And, but it was like, I felt that fire of being, that fire that I hadn't felt in years. Cause I've been in Florida now for at that time, five years. And, uh, I remember going home and just like, no, oh, it's still there. God, wow. You still desire this. And, and so then it comes to like, like I, I'm a firm believer. Like I don't try to push my way into anything. I believe that your gift will make room for itself. And so, I mean, even here, here right now, I'm able to share and, and, and I find that pretty cool. Um, I'm nervous, but it's like, I'm, I'm just thankful because I know that the Lord is doing something and, and it's scary, buddy, but it's like, I know that the Lord has strengthened me and strengthened my resolve. And, and, and again, just, and, and so like, I started seeking it out. Like I, I went to Jane to the person's house the other night because I was like, okay, I, I'm starting to study because like literally just two weeks ago, like, uh, well, somebody that I know literally just told me, and, and we weren't even talking about it, but they looked at me and said, um, you know, when the preaching is, is wrong. Like they just said that. So like, I knew that when they said that something clicked in me and I knew that they, that the, that the Lord was trying to do something because the enemy was stepping in. Like I, like, and it had been on my heart. Like it had been starting to get on my heart more and more like, you know, minister, like, like where, like, where is that? What does that look like for where? Where, where would you, I just want to be ready. Like when you say go, I want to go, that's it. And so I, I just started studying it. Cause I'm like, you know what? I, this is how I came to God. I said, God, if it's wrong, then show me it's wrong. And I'm okay with that. But if it's right, show me it's right. And I'll have to be okay with that too. But whichever it is, I just want what your will is. And he started just showing me these scriptures and I think it was like Romans 16 maybe Romans 18 and uh and starting to expound some things and I mean this was literally just like five days ago I think not even five days ago and so I'm still study but do I believe every part of me like I didn't ask for this but the Lord has put it on me yeah so do I believe that women have their place in the church for ministry I do and that's all Thanks, Tom. Yeah, the Lord. I have a few thoughts, but I'll, I'll um, go ahead. Defer. No, go ahead. Um, so there's just a few things I really wanted to... I'm not going to answer the question more specifically around... I'm going to kind of defer to these other brothers with the woman's function, because I think there's some some scripture I hope they would would expound on. And if they don't, then maybe I will, but I want to defer on that part. Um, but I just wanted to underscore some things as it relates to like are gifty. One, it's like Morgan gets saved, right? And then someone asks her to share her testimony, right? And then, and she's just obedient. I mean, just that simple obedience. Like the Lord, the Lord nudges us and we're just obedient. And so then she does it. And what happens? Well, you know, many were saved or they repented and came to the Lord, right? And so you see like, there it is. There's, there's the fruit of it, right? You see that, that fruit of the, the ministry. Um, and then others kind of recognize it. There's a witness of the body. So it's like, that's why other people are asking her to go ahead and to share and evangelize is because there's a witness. I know for Morgan, that day at the park, I had walked away. I was carrying the burden bag and I had walked away uh, for another time to burn. And all I know is I came back. To, oh, get the skin. All I know is I um I came back and everyone's like, did you hear Morgan share? It was really anointed. You know, like when she shared, it was really anointed. Well, then we've been going to the nursing home and Morgan showed up a few times. And the first time I heard her share, you know, when she shared, it was like somehow she just was able to connect right to the people. You know, a lot of us are like, want to be evangelists. Like you've got a little heart to evangelize and it's like, you want to be an evangelist because you actually do it. You actually share the gospel. But I think a lot of us are just doing the work of an evangelist. 
right? But I was like, it was so clear to me. I was like, Morgan's an evangelist. When she shares, she's just able to connect with the people. It's, it, it's just something to me, at least so clear. But there's this witness of the body, right? So in the gifting, one way we know our spot, because part of our burden for this, this specific workshop was like, how do I know my place is a button? Well, one way is there's a witness. Also, what Morgan mentioned about like the Lord opens the door for ministry. You know, sometimes we get nervous that it's like, oh, I, I think I have some calling to, let's say, preach. And I hate to focus on those gifts. I have some calling to preach, but what if I like mess up? Someone's going to never ask me again. Like if the Lord's called you to this spot, he's the one who opens the door. Whatever your gifting is, like we don't have to fight our way in. You know, we don't have to like make it happen. It's that simple. Like a lot of times, actually, if you're called, you may feel like, you know, like Stephen was sharing this morning, like, I don't want to be up here because I usually have to vomit first, you know, or you have to go through that, like, you know, ministering the word, it may seem like you come up and you share and it's this glorious thing, but as a labor of what you really have to lay down your life. There's a lot going on because that word has to get worked in you. There's a lot of overcoming, you know, not everybody who gets up, some are more comfortable with it, but not everybody's even so comfortable. You have to overcome yourself, forget about yourself. You have to depend on the Lord. There's just those things happening. So not to digress, but just to make that point, like the Lord will open the door for your spot, whether it's exercising mercy or the gift of helps. Like, it's just like, here we are. We enter God's rest and we rest from our own works. We're in that place presented to the Lord by faith. And what happens when we're just there with the Lord? He leads us. He moves. And he'll lead us into our function in the body. And we'll find that he'll open the doors that need to be opened. And um, just, just like we saw in there. Also, like when Morgan went to Florida for a few years, that gifting's kind of dormant because for whatever reason, I think when Morgan had shared this with you, she was just kind of, I kind of checked out. But as the life comes about, as there's that increase of life, that flow of life, what happens? That gifting's activated. I think sometimes our gifting isn't so clear because we're not full of life. If we're being honest, I can say for myself, when I'm not really clean and consecrated, I may still out of roteness be able to exercise that in some way, but it's not so clear. It's not so obvious. And it's not so obvious to the people, uh, you know, that, that may be around me. So just that, that illustration there. And then if we're uncertain, just a simple asking the Lord, like, Lord, I want to serve you. Here I am. Just show me my spot. It's like a simple way. And the Lord will lead us. I think as Jeffrey put it so well, like if we just exercise the grace to step into a variety of things, we'll notice as we're functioning in certain ways by the grace of God, there's a certain area that it just, the saints come up to us and say, man, amen, I was really blessed by that. I was really ministered by that. Maybe it's a, uh, I remember in the restroom once, a brother coming up to me and said, brother, I know your ministry is a hidden ministry, but there was just like an encouragement that happened, right? So um, just wanted to kind of underscore those points. Now, I didn't really address the question about the women and their function. So um, give these brothers a chance to speak to that song. <laughs>